Well, welcome everybody to tonight's author talk with one of this year's Read Me featured authors, Megan Gillis. I'm Allison Maxell of the Maine State Library here with Nicole Rancourt of the Maine Humanities Council and and Gibson Fay LeBlanc of the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. So each year we partner to bring Read Me, a summer community reading program featuring Maine authors to public libraries in their communities across Maine. And this summer celebrated Maine author Colin Woodard recommended Megan Gillis's novel Lungfish and Morgan Telty's novel Night of the Living Red, Res as must reads. If you're interested in checking these books out, reach out to your local public library. We have over 60 libraries around the state participating this year. That's so exciting. Um, before we get to the good stuff, the reason that we're all here, um, I just want to quickly go over a few things. The first is to just let you all know that we are having a conversation with Morgan Talty on August 9th at 6.30 p.m. Please note that it's starting a little bit earlier than this evening's conversation. You can get further information about that and register and all of the good stuff at mainhumanities.org. I will pop that in the chat in a little bit. Um, we are recording this event in the hopes of making the archive available to everybody. And we're also connecting to Facebook Live. So hi, everyone on Facebook. For those of you joining on Zoom, if you have questions, you can just click on the question and answer button. You can type your question there. You can type something in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that the whole time. If you are on Facebook, I will be checking checking out and making sure that I catch all of your comments and questions. So I will bring them into the conversation as you share them with me. Um, the other thing to acknowledge is that we do live in a state where internet connectivity can sometimes be a little unstable. Um, this is true for pretty much everybody here this evening. So if one of us kind of disappears suddenly, um, that is probably why, and we will do our best to find our way back to you all um, but there shouldn't be much disruption, disruption at all. And I'll hand it over to you, Gibson. All right. Now, uh, what we're really here for, um, I'm going to introduce Megan. Um, so Megan Gillis uh, attended the Bennington Writing Seminars and is a fellow of the Hewn Oaks Artist Residency. She has worked as a journalist, a bookseller, a librarian, and a hospital worker, and lives in Portland. Lungfish is her first novel. And about it, Paul Yoon writes, Lungfish, quote, Lungfish is a force of nature, a deeply felt marvel of a book that navigates grief, parenthood, and the mysteries of family with unrelenting power and precision. Here is a story about the islands we build and carry with us. Here is storytelling at its best. So Megan, welcome, congratulations. I know folks are eager to hear from you, so maybe you can start us off by telling us a little bit about where this book started, what, what, what the seeds of the story um, were. Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, and it's such an honor to be uh, part of this program. So um, so yeah, the, the seeds of this book, um, I feel like I've been struggling with a sort of succinct way to say this as honestly as possible, but um, when I started this book, uh, like the narrator, I was um, I was trying to understand and work my way through a situation that I had little control over. Um, motherhood, sort of having this other life attached to my own life um, and sort of balancing that with the addictions of a loved one uh, and sort of trying to stay afloat. So um, uh, being a persistently very stubborn person who always likes to not take any conventional advice. I sort of decided the best way for me to navigate through the situation was to sort of create um, an adjacent fictional world and a set of fictional characters uh, that I could sort of explore, um, not exactly matching circumstances, but um, some similar conditions. Um, some similar personality traits and um, yeah, and see what I could figure out that way. Um, so, you know, what I was noticing was um, 
how interesting the difficulties that I was going through were, uh, was, I should say. Um, and I really wanted to just, uh, at least like once a day, capture some emotional state that was surprising to me. Um, and often I ended up tying that to a relationship with a child or a relationship to the natural world and just sort of developed all these little, little moments. Um, and then as I sort of worked my way through the situation more and developed a little more objectivity and distance, then I got to sort of enter this phase of revision where then I was sort of crafting this material um, into something that was less exploratory and more um, was reflective of sort of um, things that, that I had I had learned. So, you know, through that, that distance that I gained over the five and a half years that it took to write this book, I was able to sort of exert some control over um, over the book and to some extent over my life. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's great. Thanks, Megan. Um, do you do you want to uh, read us a little a little bit just to give folks who um, haven't read the book a taste or and or just to the folks who have read the book or are reading the book chance to hear your voice when you when you read it yeah absolutely uh so i thought i would try reading something that i haven't read before um from about a third of the way into the novel um from a section that's called message um and a few things i think it would be helpful to know simply is that uh, generally, in case you don't know what the book is about at all, there is a family, um, which includes a husband, wife, and a young child. Um, a child is two. Her name is Agnes. Our narrator, Tuck, the wife and mother, um, and then the husband, Paul. And they're, uh, they've taken up residence on this otherwise unoccupied island um, and are kind of have ended up realizing they're kind of stuck there. Um, because of the husband's um, addiction, they have no money and uh, they, a whole set of circumstances. So they're here, they're, they're stuck here for now. They can't get off. Um, Paul, the husband has been trying to detox. Tuck, the narrator has been trying to earn some cash by selling bumper sticker kits that her father manufactured and abandoned many years back. Um, and Tuck and Agnes, the child are spending a lot of time together. Um, they're under pressure to get off the island sort of as um, before the season changes or before the executor of um, the grandmother's estate realizes that they're living there. Um, Tuck doesn't know whether that would be a problem or not, but doesn't really want to ask um, in case it is a problem. Uh, and the other little thing to know is just that Tuck has become sort of unintentionally estranged from her own immediate fam family, her mother, her father, her brother, um, and being in this space where she spent time as a child with them um, sort of occasion some uh, reflection on the time they spent together. So, nature. To the south, the yellow and red ferry is crossing the bay to the populated islands. The islands with roads and electricity and ice cream shops and small art galleries for the tourists. The boat's a good two miles out and won't be coming any closer. Agnes and I count the starfish we see from the dock. At low tide lately, we can spot them by the dozens clinging to the underwater rocks. This is how it is here. Species bloom, then disappear. There were hermit crabs by the thousands in the shallows only days ago. Now we can't find a single one. Agnes wants me to pick a starfish up. I don't know how hard they can suck. She won't let me get away with my fear. Will it bite you, Mama? What? No, baby. Pick it up. No, baby, I don't think. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. I plunge my arm into the shallow water up to my shoulder and peel one up, a little one. It's rougher than I expected, harder. I wait for the pain. I flatten my palm and feel its little suckers searching. I feel its otherworldliness. Agnes is delighted. I try not to show my fear. Can I eat it, Mama? I can't take it anymore. I throw it into the water. 
Agnes erupts. To the north hangs a dull fog like a curtain, maybe 30 yards out. Coming through it now is the white boat I've seen before, attended by a flock of gulls, its lines strong but simple. Straight on, coming out of the pallor, the boat has a face. The two windows of the wheelhouse are the wide open eyes, the orange life ring situated below them, a little mouth of surprise. As it turns to sidle up along a buoy, brown I can just barely see with a yellow stripe, I see the form again, the curve of it in its orange slickers as it bends to the ropes and hauls the trap over that makes me look harder. I'm sorry, I tell Agnes. That was bad of me. Very bad, she corrects. Each moment, there's the possibility that another kit is selling. At the library, I Google squatters rights, Maine, but no. To claim rights to a property here, you must first live in it or on it for 20 years. You must show you've made improvements. Back at the house, a breeze has disturbed our card house. I set about rebuilding it, unprompted by Agnes, to whom I've given our last can of peach halves and juice. What remains? A can of peas, a can of chickpeas, a slender sleeve of spaghetti noodles. In the refrigerator, I know, are the last dregs of the strawberry milk I caved on, half an apple bearing its oxidized face and arc of black seeds. What remains? Our privacy, which is a relief. Since Paul's night at Agnes's bedside, he's tucked himself away again. On the radio, reports of bad weather blowing in, a small craft advisory. I'd like to listen longer. There's a story beginning about a female Bhutanese falconer navigating the world of IVF, but I unplug it from the wall. Diesel doesn't grow on trees. I let Agnes do it. Into each of the six little burrows I've made with my fingers, she drops a single black seed from our apple. Together, we push the soil back over them. Why not? Our basket, an imperfectly shaped thing woven from strips of reed dyed yellow and teal, is nearly full. We look for the shells that remain unblemished. No holes, no cracks, no mold, not too damp. This is difficult. These acorns spent the winter on the ground, and worse, the spring. Our plan is to crack them with a hammer and grind the meat into something like a flower. A gust of wind pushes the upper branches of the trees toward the west. Agnes and I look up. Like most sky phenomena, it makes me feel like part of the world. What that noise, mama? Wind, baby. That. I listen harder. The trees are groaning, sharp, creaking, complaints. Now I see it's everywhere on top of everything else, the threat of being crushed. From where we stand, I can see at least three thick birches straining. Oh, that, I say. That's the trees saying it's time to go inside. Agnes doesn't want to go inside. I drag her kicking and screaming. Inside the house, there is Paul, sitting there on the sofa. He looks bad, but better. I'm sorry. Did I hear it? It was nearly caught in his throat. The rain is loud. I keep walking, cutting through to the kitchen, just as I'd planned to light a fire in the stove. We're soaking wet. It's fear though, more than anger. Fear that my anger will make me do the wrong thing and wreck him, send him back. While the kitchen fills with smoke, I try to unclench my jaw. At least I know who won't appear in this weather, the executor. I'd looked for her first in the creek, sure she had drowned somewhere between its bursting banks. The roots of the slippery elms were exposed. If it hadn't happened, how could I see it so clearly? I entered the barn behind her and she didn't see me. I watched as my mother braided the roan mare's mane. The gray mare was still in her stall. The roan mare chewed on hay while my mother gently brushed her white mane down along the side of her long neck with the soft brush. My mother was talking. I could make out the soft tone, but not the words. The murmurs became harsher as she divided the mane into sections, tying each one off with a band. 
There was just enough edge in her voice, just in that fraction of a moment in which each band snapped into place to sense that there was anger inside of her, not anger directed at the horse, just anger that was being released slowly and quietly, almost inaudibly, as the horse chewed, not minding. After she left, left us, I mean, I found Conrad weeping. He was 12. Who will love us, he said. Dad, I blurted, almost angry. But I regretted it right away. Regretted not asking him what he felt was gone, what he perceived as our mother's love. Did she have a way of running her fingers through his curly hair, a secret wink across the dinner table? And I'm left with this doubt. Was she broken or was I? What had I missed? I've given up on keeping a fire. Our skin and hair and clothes hold the water anyway. Sitting next to the stove, Agnes had steamed. To get warm, we bury ourselves together in blankets. If I were kinder, I think, I would go to him. I've discovered a canister in a low cabinet behind the mess of my grandmother's pans and dented measuring cups, her old crank sifter with its wire mesh that's clogged with hard white sediment. The rice might have been in there five, 10, 15 years, no telling. I reach my hand into the canister, feeling for unwanted objects as the grains filter through my fingers. I saw a mare, not our own, this was later, relieved from her misery. The fur on her muzzle was worn away by her violent rubbing of her head against the wall. I was shown the moldy corn behind her incurable illness the slides of the liquefaction of the white matter of her brain. Lakes where fields should be. My hand is coated in a fine white powder. I beckon Agnes. She stands before me and I spread out my fingers. I press my hand against the damp blue sweater over her belly and pull it back to let her see the print I've left against the blue. Want to do it, she says, as I knew she would. I let her put her own hand into the rice and she puts her mark on me. I'll stop there. That's great. It's great to hear you read, read, read from the book. Um, <clears throat> sets the tone. Um, so it's lovely. Um, so um, I mentioned before we got on that I was I was talking about Lungfish with a coworker who also read it and, and loved it recently, um, and um, this person Taryn and I were talking about the structure of the book and and how it must how it might have evolved during the revision process and you talked a little bit about that at the start um, these these little moments that you assembled and then or just collected and then started I'm, I'm imagining assembling them so I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that um how did you did you have like a lot of stuff and you paired back to small or smaller amounts of stuff or how did you start to string these things together or string them into some kind of a thing that a structure that seemed like it like it made sense or that it worked for the story that you were trying to tell whatever you want to say about sort of that revision process and the, that process of going from lots of like a chaos of moments <laughs> to, you know, a collection of moments. Yeah, uh, it was a it was a mess, and it was uh, really difficult and really depressing because yes, I I wrote in these sort of vignettes, and I didn't have much thought for where I was going, and I wasn't even worried too much about story as I was drafting and writing these bits I just sort of had this faith that it would all come together somehow um so yeah so when I started trying to make it all come together somehow um I did what a lot of people do which is I you know physically printed everything out and cut it up and you know would the few hours I would have to myself while everybody else is out of the house would just put these pieces all over the house and then I sort of separated them according to timelines, you know, all right, all the flashbacks go here, the present moment goes here, the recent past goes here, um, just to make sure that there was sort of like cohesion throughout and make sure everything jived um, before I began 
taking everything apart again. Um, because when you lay a novel out chronologically, it becomes very, very boring. And when I saw it <laughs> that way, it was just like horrified. I was like, oh, what is this? Um, so, so yeah, there's definitely an art <laughs> to construction. Uh, so then I missed it. But what I did recognize there too, that became the most challenging. And to answer your question, I didn't end up getting rid of a lot of material. Um, but I did have to change a lot of material because so much of um, particularly Tuck's emotional state is sort of tied to what's happening in the natural world. Um, you know, I wrote this over five books sort of reflecting on the things in nature that I was observing at that moment. So sort of in terms of the phenology of the place when certain plants are doing certain things, it didn't necessarily match up with the timeline that I needed to constrain this book to. Um, so there was a fair amount of rewriting just to sort of be respectful of uh, <laughs> the actual way that the world works. Yeah. yeah. And then there was some new writing to do to just sort of um, try to heighten some some tension and sort of develop the arc a little more. Right on. Um, and let, we had, I noticed too, I should say also that um, people are already doing it, but feel free to put questions in the chat. We will we will get to those certainly. I'm already seeing stuff um, that's, that's uh, prompting me to turn in certain directions. Um, and on that note, I wanted to talk a little bit, ask you to talk a little bit, Megan, about the, the island um, where the book is set. Um, There's some people in the chat wondering about if it's near Portland, if it's down east or just, but, but, so, but in a larger level, like um, if you could say something about how did you went about imagining this place and imagining, I'm sure there's some, some real places that you were in your mind also, but it's, it, it also feels like a, a fiction um, too. So how did you navigate that? Just sort of creating this this island that would work for the book, but also be feel like it fit in in the in Maine. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely I didn't want to pin it to a particular island in proximity to a particular city. Um, you know, I I do did want to keep it removed a bit. Um, I, I do have um, the privilege of having grown up spending um, time in the summer uh, at my grandparents' house, which was on an island um, down here in Casco Bay. So, you know, I, that has shown up in my writing over and over again, just sort of as, you know, it's the place that feels the most like home to me, even though it's never been my like home home. Um, and I just think we end up writing about those places a lot. Um, and, you know, I think it worked. It, I didn't necessarily plan it, but in the end, you know, using an island um, just sort of to reinforce these themes of, of isolation, I think, um, became useful. Cool. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm going to take a question from the chat. Um, uh, Tani and Ben, I don't know if it's Tani or Ben, but Tani and Ben are wondering um, if you would describe your writing in this novel as stream of consciousness, or how would you describe what the style is? Um, and how did you sort of land on the style that the novel is written in, um, I think is, is the heart of the question. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how to describe it. I think I think of it, and maybe I would say it's like moment by moment fiction, um, or sort of like progressive fiction. Um, you know, I really admire other books that are written in that sort of like um, journal entry style, because I like as a reader, discovering things as the character discovers them. And that's, to me, that's a really uh, exciting perspective to get to, to hold as a writer to keep the readers um, mostly just as in the dark about what's happening and to stumble upon these sort of, I mean, I hate to say epiphanies, but sometimes that's what they are, realizations. Um, yeah, I think just staying in that moment and within that perspective just makes for some really fun moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Allison, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, so I'm, on the same vein, I, on the writing process, um, 
Kartika Wright in the chat says, it's always lovely to hear authors read their own work. And she says, I found this book almost poetic. And I was always um, struck by a lot of the reviews, whether it was the New York Times and all the people that reviewed it, it often referred to it as lyrical and just your writing style. And then I wondered about just the intentionality of the chapters and how you named them and the, it just seems to be so much symbolism and everything's kind of tied together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can try. Yeah, it's really nice that people find the language poetic. I don't consider myself a poet, but you know, maybe all of us have a little bit of that instinct for rhythm or something. Uh, you guys probably just saw that recent Atlantic article about how scientists now have like proven that the um seismic waves created during the big boom are like now traveling inside every living thing <laughs> on earth and so we all have you know these these waves moving through us and i do think just as humans we have that if we're sort of attuned to it we can do something with that um so yeah the chapters were funny um allison uh i went through a period of about four months with this book when I absolutely hated it. It was shortly after I had laid it all out chronologically and then tried to reconstruct it in a way that made sense. Um, and there was just like, just like this, like slumps, like the middle 60 pages are just like, oh, like what is, this is so dull, but I couldn't figure out how to manage the material anymore. I just felt overwhelmed. And then I just, this is so silly. I remembered about chapters. Like I remembered that novelists often use <laughs> chapters and they construct chapters and then uh, fit those in around one another. Um, so literally just like in over the course of a day, I broke the whole thing up into all these tiny little chapters. And that helped me sort of recognize things that were carrying over some of the, the symbols, the themes. Um, and it became so fun to um, pull out those words that to me sort of spoke a little bit adjacently to what that chapter was about. Mm -hmm. I was always a short story writer before this. I never intended to write a novel. This just like told me it was going to be a novel. So in my, def in my defense, I was <laughs> slow to coming to the idea of chapters. Yes, only because they were completely unfamiliar to me as a writer. So there's one question here too from um, Anita on Facebook. She says, I'm curious about how the author conjured this main character. Was it from imagination, familiarity with similar real life experience portrayed in the story? Can you talk a little bit about Tuck? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tuck is only a few steps away from me. She has my own like proclivity towards like denial and stubbornness and sort of uh, tendency towards, you know, not asking for help or self-isolation. So, um, you know, the foundation of her is me. Um, I don't consider this auto fiction, but I I do like what the writer Claire Bay Watkins, who has written a number of books, including I Love You, But I've Chosen Darkness. She was sort of trying to explain why auto fiction is useful in literature. And I liked what she said, which is that it sort of allows the writer to ascribe a few traits to a character that are different from the author's own traits that then allows the author to sort of explain or sort of explore, you know, what might have, what might have happened, um, potentially to make the story more interesting, um, or just to explore those different sort of spinoffs that life can take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the themes that I picked up on through the book too was around um, food and sustenance versus pleasure. And some of the other reviews picked up on that as well. Um, it figures strongly. Um, did you intentionally do that or was it just happened to be the central thread um, or did it just kind of occur over time? And again, even, even with the food piece, it was, um, just your choices of just really showing the rawness of the island life and, and being true to what, you know, someone might be forced to find and, and look to for sustenance um, from nature. 
Yeah, I think, you know, the focus on hunger was just came out of respect for reality, which is that a person in that situation would be very hungry and that hunger would be behind everything that they were doing. It would be driving everything they were doing. Um, you know, I did experience a hunger and experiencing some hunger will uh, kind of allow you to imagine what more hunger might feel like. Um, for myself, you know, in many ways, I am so you know, something I learned in my own experiences is that I'm so lucky to have the safety nets that I do. You know, I say over the course of writing this book, I was so humbled to realize like, oh my gosh, if I was a person without the small group of people who will step in and help me, like I, you know, I would be truly hungry. I would not have a roof over my head. So it was, um, I think just, yeah, just honoring that fact that that hunger is what would consume you if you were in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, the idea of hunger has a lot of, you know, beautiful metaphorical. Yeah. Just, I'm yeah. just going to jump in there for a second. Um, Joe had a comment about the hunger uh, in the in the chat. Also, she said, wrenching pervasive pervasive hunger is a deep part of Tuck and Agnes's experience, both on the island and before. Um, and then she was also wondering about whether that was some kind of intentional choice that I mean, humanities made and the Read Me program, all of us made. And the answer to that is no. Colin would have just picked this book because he loved it. So, um, but but uh, I'm glad that it's raising those, you know, other issues for folks and, and uh, getting them to think about what it's like to be hungry because I think that's what one of the things this book does. Um, uh, and we have uh, Steve who is going to uh, unmute himself and ask a question. Steve, do you want to ask your question? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Megan, congratulations again on the debut novel. So uh, two things I wanted to say. One is I had a question. Um, did you intend the story to be about sort of living off the land and being a minimalist in life? And second part of my question or comment is I loved all the kit slogans and I want you to know I've copyrighted all those and if I make any money I'll send you some royalty yeah. <laughs> okay but be careful because my actual dad in real life actually invented a bumper sticker kit uh, <laughs> and so as long as <laughs> okay, okay as long right, as you I can take it with him and don't steal the name of his you know kit business <laughs> okay I, I take it back I don't want to be sued I take it back no, <laughs> not by him <laughs> yeah um, uh for your question first question about whether I sort of intended it to be about you know living off the land and foraging and stuff I, you know um I guess I wanted, I mean, it just became that naturally because of the situation, but it was interesting to me to be writing this in this moment where there's all this sort of um, interest in the foraging lifestyle and the min minimalist lifestyle, but from a much more privileged place. Um, so it was a little bit fun for me to just write it from a different perspective. Um, and I say that acknowledging that I'm a person with lots of privilege. <laughs> so I, I, um, you know, I feel like I can, I can sort of straddle the lines though. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause Rachel said, as a kid, I love stories about wilderness survival. So the setting and struggles of the family on the Island in this book reminded me of that, but it was much more re realistic and grown up. Um, so kind of goes in hand with what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. I actually just started, um, reading my side of the mountain to my daughter wow. two nights ago and the first chapter is about like he like pounding acorns and i was like oh that must have like <laughs> lodged in my head all those years ago yeah yeah <clears throat> so as a mother and uh wife in real life how how difficult or yeah just emotional you know herring was it to write this book that centers on a mother and wife and care of the dot daughter and having to face all those hard choices and um you know tough questions I, mean, yeah. I mean I think that it, um again to be very clear like this the situations in this book are very different from the situations in my own life so it's just sort of some 
some conditions that are shared. So the the actual events that are unfolding here are separate from the events of my own life. Um, but uh, that didn't stop me from confusing them sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I don't feel like I'm a person with like great mental capacity for keeping everything in their proper boxes. So, you know, some, some of the sort of like, um, grudgingness I may have felt after working on a particular part of the book sometimes did follow me back into real life when it was completely, um, in, you know, inappropriate, um, and unhelpful, but on the whole, I would say writing the book for me as difficult as it was sort of emotionally was, um, absolutely necessary. I mean, it, I sort of think of, I, I think of this novel as sort of being like, it was always like a ship. <laughs> and at times it was like the ship that was keeping me afloat. And at times it was like the ship that was leaking and sinking me and sucking me down with it when there was all this other like real life stuff that I should have been tending to. Um, but in the end, like, I don't, I think it is what got me through a difficult time and helped me process it um and ultimately sort of feel on on top of it yeah. um there, there's another uh question in the chat um that's sort of in a different takes us in a different direction um uh did, did you think you would get did you think that the book would get as much attention as it has and how do how do, and has it been difficult to talk about publicly or to do lots of events and just like how has that been? Mm, yeah, no, I always assumed that it would appeal to like twelve people, and that my publisher was going to like never look at me again. I would never be able to like show my face around them or anything. Um, so I don't, you know, I I like got a report of the sales number at some point and numbers I don't know at some point it's just like yeah that's crazy that that many people have read this book I don't even know what that means um it's not a huge number though don't worry it's not like whatever but um but it's more way more yes it's way more than 12 uh as far as the speaking goes uh I find it very difficult I really I you know as you all know Cormac McCarthy died recently and we all, all got to be reacquainted <laughs> with his um refusal to speak about his books because he would say every everything you need to know is in the book and I actually <laughs> respect that and admire it um obviously the you know the book is what I put all the work into and so that's really how I hope people engage directly with the book I'm not a confident public speaker uh so to quickly answer yes this has helped me um get over my I think perfectionism I think part of my fear of speaking is this fear of embarrassing myself or saying something that's not as eloquent as it might be if I had was able to spend time with it on the page um, but yeah, so that's been great to just learn how to try to speak with people. Yeah. Dan and Betsy, um, just let me see what their question was. How important, let me just so I'm scrolling, how important were the opinions of other readers in your revision process? Um, how much did you change the text after showing it to other readers? Hmm. I did not show it to many people. Um, I have the world's best agent, Sarah Bolin, who also, she was, she worked as an editor for a solid decade before she moved to agenting. And she definitely was my sounding board for the first few years before we started bringing it to publishers. So, uh, I kept it pretty private, um, got a lot of great feedback from her. I will say um, it was so fascinating when we began chopping it around. You know, so it's published by Catapult, which is an indie publisher. And I did end up working with my wonderful editor, Kendall Story, there to change some things about the book. Um, but it was really more about sort of intensifying the themes that were already there. Um, whereas it was interesting to see some of the feedback we got from bigger houses, I didn't have any offers, but what I got was like, well, this would be mar more marketable if you were willing to do this or do that, um, which was a little bit like heartbreaking. You know, it was just sad to understand that part of the industry. Um, but it was nice for me to get to sort of say no thank you to that. Um, 
and embrace the indie-ness of it, especially since I don't think I've said this yet, but the true genesis of this book is it began as a a joke. I sort of tricked myself <laughs> into writing it um, during a time of financial desperation. I thought, what kinds of jobs can I get in Maine that pay me anything <laughs> based on the degrees that I have? And there are not many options. So I said to my best friend, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to write a bestseller. I have a, I went, you know, I went to Pennington. How hard can it be to just write a bestseller? Um, so when I, you know, when I first got going, I, I, I think it was that lie I was telling myself about what my goal was because it was a joke. I would never try, you know, but it's what got me in in the chair, I guess. But maybe there was a little bit of persistence that you share with Tuck. <laughs> maybe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Private yeah. secret persistence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a couple others in the chat, Gibson, if you want to take yeah. those. Kind yeah, of take well, it in a different direction. Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, this one's quick, but uh, Lori was wondering if you're familiar with Emma Donahue's book, Room. And she said that your book, Sense of Claustrophobia and Anguish, reminded me of that novel. Um, I haven't read it. I remember when it came out. Yeah. You, you know, it never occurred to me to sort of read that. But I will say, this is my stubbornness coming through again. I actively avoid any books that were written that might be similar to something that I'm trying to do. Because as a writer, it's so easy to be dissuaded from writing anything. And if you think somebody has already explored a theme or... You know, told a story in a way that is probably better than the way you can tell it. I, I don't know. It's just so easy to get scared off something. So, pretty much any time along the way, I said, "Oh, you're writing about this. You should read such and such." I just feel like, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> not gonna. Not now. Um, never, terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> uh, and Stacy writes um, that the addiction in this book was a key topic of our library discussion group. And it was surprising to see how many of us have been affected in some way by addiction, loving or caring for those who are addicts. Was that part of what you were hoping to do with your novel to get people talking about this issue, not just in our state, but everywhere? Yeah, obviously it's a huge issue that's ruining a lot of lives. And I think, um, I think there are still a lot of people who have been untouched by it and who I think can benefit from a nuanced, compassionate treatment of it. And it was particularly, yes, I wanted to, um, this book to me just felt a little bit like a handshake with other, you know, family members uh, or loved ones of people with addiction because that is such a uniquely horrible experience. Um, but I also did want to, use it to sort of shed light on the topic to people who might still be unfamiliar. Sure. There were a couple questions. Um, uh, one was from Steve. Um, can we make some assumptions about what happens to Paul? Um, people weren't feeling very optimistic. And then the other question was, um, people weren't familiar with the drug um, in the book and if you could speak a little bit to that um yeah yeah um so the drug kratom kratom say it however you'd like um was one that also was not familiar to me until i became acquainted with it um and uh i really when i was writing like initially, like initially when I was really like writing sort of compulsively and trying to capture these states of disorientation, I dropped it in there as a placeholder because that felt like something separate to figure out to me. Just sort of like sometimes you give a character a letter for a name or something just, you know, just for now. So it was a placeholder that I always figured I'd sort of come back and maybe change to something more familiar pe to people, maybe just make it heroin or something. Um, but then I realized, I think what using a substance that people are less familiar with is that people are slower to feel like they understand a situation and are more willing to remain in a state of suspension um, and remain curious, remain open-minded. Um, and I thought that helped keep the reader closer to Tuck's own experience of her story. Yeah. Do you want to speculate about Paul or? 
Oh, we, what was the first part? I'm not good at remembering. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, do we should we should we do that or do we? Did we oh. do that? I don't know. You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want you want. Uh yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, I like a book that lands on a question and it's not all tied up for you. Um I will say, you know, I have my own ideas about what happened to Paul. Um it's not spelled out, but if you read the cues, you can see that this you know, novel is set sort of slightly, it's during the Trump era, era pre-COVID, you know, we don't have any COVID references, so we can imagine um, what's going to happen in the years immediately after this book, the story closes. Um, and that's gonna mean um, a loss of uh, even, a loss, even deeper loss of access um, to help for people who need help. Um, obviously the pandemic was, horrible for people experiencing addiction. Many, many more people died than would have if services had been up and running. Um, so take that as you will, but uh, you know, I didn't, I think as I finished drafting the novel, I did not know, you know, what we were heading into, mm -hmm. um, which is another interesting thing about, about the book. When I was writing this initially, I was like, oh, this is so like dark and heavy and who's going to want to read this book just these 12 people okay 12 people are going to be willing to get dark and heavy with me and then by the time we were in like 2021 <laughs> the book is getting ready to come out I was like well this is a beach read by today's <laughs> by today standards like, and here we are summer reading, summer reading discussion yeah. well maybe we were all lungfish you were, we yeah. were all hovered down and under the mud and then we yeah. just surfaced um <laughs> Which kind of gets me to the question too, like how did you come up with that symbolism in the name of the title of the book? That I grew up in Down East Maine, a uh, little town called Cutler. And so like every descriptive scene of being on the island and the, um, you know, the brackweed and all of that, it just brought like nostalgic remembrances of, of home. And, um, but I had never heard the term lungfish before. Um, yeah. I can't remember how exactly it worked its way in. So I will say that at the time I started writing this book, I was working at the Portland Public Library. And part of the lovely thing about, I spent some of my time behind the circulation desk uh, feeling people's returns. And there are a lot of little tidbits I got from books coming through the returns bin, you know, during slow, slow minutes, pretty much anything having to do with the natural world, I would just thumb through and I'd be like, I like this fact or, you know, oh, this is a beautiful name of this plant. I'm going to, you know, work on this. So I'm sure somebody returned a book that was about lungfish or something. And I learned about this animal. And then um, I don't remember planting it in there necessarily. It wasn't like, oh, this is, this is it. Um, it was just a small moment within the book, just a small little metaphor um, that was a little different from the other references to the natural world and that it, uh, the rest of the natural world is very of, of the place, uh, you know, it's very much, uh, tied to the setting. Um, but the lungfish is a creature that lives in Africa and Australia, prehistoric. It's not on this continent. Um, so in my mind, it did become a little bit more tied to Tuck, who is herself not, um, of, of the place. She, I don't think we talked about this, but she has arrived on this Island from, um, an apartment in Pittsburgh. Previously, she'd been living in Vermont, but she grew up down in Indiana. So um, aside from some summers spent here, she can't, she doesn't have any particular claim to be native to the place. Um, so the book, it was not called Lungfish. It was called something totally different, um, which I'm embarrassed to say now. And then it was called something different again, which I'm embarrassed to say. And then it just didn't have a title for like a very panicky month. Um, and then, um, and then we, came up with long question which was like oh yeah that. and then it allowed for that beautiful cover that nicole mm. oh, it's gorgeous gorgeous it's so it's yeah. yeah very captivating too because it just has the big question around the term too so um it landed well with the name <laughs> it also i did not foresee this but i think you know writing this novel was very much to me like having a second child <laughs> child and in fact yeah. I did not end up having a second child I think I wrote this book instead uh, by by accident <laughs> but um I having it be lungfish <laughs> helped mm -hmm. like helped me feel like I could let it go like mm -hmm. in, instead of like having this fear of like oh not like a, I have to like separate myself from my book and I can't touch it anymore and it's done I just it's like helpful to be like all right like go swim 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to scan down through and see if there are any more questions coming in. Um, I know someone had asked earlier about just um, the fact that thought the tuck was vegetarian, but they did eat green crab. Like they didn't go fit. Like they didn't go fishing, but it's hard to fish off an island. Um, anyway, um, was there anything to that? Yeah, so we see Tuck breaking her vegetarianism, yeah. uh, her lifelong vegetarianism. Um, and definitely to me, that was a focus. And, you know, it's in contrast to her daughter, Tuck, who's just like, or her, her daughter, Agnes, who's like, give me everything, I'll, I'll eat everything. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, I think I myself am a lifelong vegetarian, but I do like to acknowledge that that comes from a place of privilege and being able to choose the food that I mm -hmm. eat. And when you can't choose, you might make different choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Megan, do you care to say anything about things that you're working on now? <laughs> Feel free to say as little or as much as you would like to. Yeah. What am I doing? Um, I am trying to finish a collection of short stories. Um, they bear some similarity to Lungfish in that they do, and this is never my intention, but looking back now on these some of these stories, which I wrote quite a few years ago, most of them are told in the first person and um, involve <laughs> the narrator um, losing some psychological footing. Um, so I'm looking at these stories, most of which were written sort of before I learned a lot, I mean, before I had a kid, before I, you know, had a lot of more grown up experiences. And to me, looking at them, like, well, I like these, but they seem kind of naive, you know, and it's also they're written, again, pre Trump and pre COVID. And um, it just feels like they're written from a different world and are a little bit um, naive in that way. Um, so what I've been thinking about is a way to sort of bridge them, like continue writing stories that sort of create a bridge for those earlier stories and bring them into this current space in which now we don't really have this focus on individual characters who are losing their footing. Like instead, we just have this world that has sort of spun off its access. And the question now is really more like, how can you be sane in this world? And is it not maybe more sane to be <laughs> in insane? <laughs> like, I guess I, I have developed quite a... Um, uh, sympathy towards um, what we see as insanity because it makes more sense to me. Yes. Yeah. Nicole just sent another one in from Facebook. This was from Anita. Uh, she says the book was dark and heavy and also hopeful. Tuck seems to have space to come up for air and let a new reality wash over her and direct her choices. Do you have Let's see, Teresa, as she goes back to the mainland towards those last pages of the story, do you have hope for Tuck? Um, do you have the hope future? for Tuck? <laughs> do you have hope for Tuck if she faces the future? I know. I'd love to turn, that's a question I would like to turn back to the crowd. Uh, <laughs> I guess everybody ask themselves, do you have hope for Tuck? I, uh, I, I, say, I have hope for Tuck. I have hope for Tuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will say, I mean, it was really interesting to work with the idea of hope because I think for, I mean, anyone who loves an addict knows that hope can be a totally destructive force and it's also completely necessary. And somehow you have to figure out what kind of hope is the right kind of hope to be having at any given moment. And it's a complete, um, you know, mind, it, it baffles, it baffles one. <laughs> um, so it, it was, it was fun to just sort of explore hope and sort of uh, show how even when Tuck was maybe doing the right thing by having hope, there was just like one little like detail that was askew that meant it was the wrong kind of hope to be having in that moment. And sometimes I think, you know, I like to keep the readers just a tiny little step ahead of her so that maybe they could see, um, oh, this isn't, She's not doing the right thing here. This isn't the right thing to be hopeful about. Um, yeah. yeah. But I'm glad you guys have hope for Tuck. Yeah. Well, we're ending on a good note. We have about five minutes left. Maybe time for one more question, but I love the fact that we're ending on hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Megan, I'm wondering if um, what's if if you've had time for some summer reading yourself this summer, or if there's been anything that's been particularly good uh, written by other people that you've you've been able to pick up recently. Oh. Um. Yeah, you should have warned me that I should, I should have, have, should have, I should have warned you. Sorry, I didn't warn you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I, I mean, Morgan's book is excellent. I, it was a few months ago that I read it, but it, it did really jump out at me. Um, and right now what I'm working my way through is, um, it's not a novel, but it's, um, that book, uh, An Immense World by Ed Young. Do you guys know that one? It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of pop science, but it's just sort of explores um, the different sort of sensory perspectives that all these different animals on the earth experience and sort of reveals to us this understanding that the world that we perceive and experience is not the only world that there is. Like the air is full of signals that we can't pick up on, um, that all these different species are completely tied up with. Um, so that's been it's a huge book and it's going to take me a year to finish it um and i've been reading some beautiful stories i just finished um you mentioned paul Yoon. we started paul Yoon. i just finished his story that was published in the new yorker um the other day of course i can't remember the title of it now but a beautiful story exploring the aftermath of the korean war mm -hmm. yeah somebody else made a comment in the chat uh, earlier um asking if we had picked uh two books that had nonlinear <laughs> arcs uh, for read me on purpose. Also not, not, yeah, I don't think that was Colin's uh, idea there. It just so happened that, you know, both your, in different ways, your, your book and Morgan's book tell stories in a, in a, in a nonlinear, in a nonlinear way. Yeah. And they both deal with addiction. And I, what I have found mm -hmm. interesting about thinking the book side by side is how they come to it from such different places. I mean, more Morgan's book is so, funny and involves characters who take uh this relationship with drugs for granted you know like this is just like embedded and everybody yeah 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 like it's just it's just there um yeah i have enjoyed thinking about that relationship i think that's the exciting part when we do the read me is the recommending author is like you you don't know where it's going to end up <laughs> and it's always um scintillating and and surprising and uh definitely uh um, each each year we do it, it has a certain feel, so uh, it's fun. Um, so we're actually getting, believe it or not, it's 7.59. Um, Megan, thank you so much um, for spending time with us this evening. Um, I want to thank everybody else uh, for being so engaged this evening. The questions were just pouring in. Um, it was actually difficult to scroll down through. Um, they were thoughtful. Um, so I learned a lot. Um, and uh, we just really appreciate you and appreciate your work. And uh, everybody statewide gets to enjoy it. Um, we just infused a whole bunch of books into our ILL system. Um, uh, the Main State Library. So if you haven't got a book or your book group needs extra copies, put those requests in and we'll make sure we get them to you via our wonderful van delivery. Um, so thank you all. I'll turn it back over to Nicole. Yeah, just to echo, thank you to everybody um, here this evening. Thank you to Gibson and Allison for holding this space and Megan for being so generous with your your time um, and thank you to everybody who is asking questions and just absorbing this evening um, again if you're interested in reading this book or night of the living res you can probably find it at your local library because there are a lot of them who have a lot of copies around the state but you can also find it at your local bookseller as well um, and i guess the last thing is just to say i hope we see you on august 9th when we're we're talking with morgan Thanks, Thank everybody. You all have a wonderful evening. All right. Take bye care. Bye. Thank you, Megan. Thank you.